Good evening. I'm Cynthia Jackson Elmore, Dean of the Honors College, and it's my pleasure to join, have you join us this evening. I want to make sure I don't forget to introduce a couple people. I'm looking around the room. Stephanie CPAC is in the back there. She is the Honors College Communications Manager and all things Sharper Focus Wider Lens Extraordinaire. My partner in education over at the far side, John Beck. Um, who comes up with all the great topics and recruits our panelists. Claire Wismer in the back, she is a communications intern in the Honors College and also want to thank the Alumni Association and the audience we have joining us through live stream. So also going to ask if you can be attentive to your cell phones. I realize that you may need them for a variety of reasons. We are also streaming live and so just be attentive to what that might mean. Um, we are proud to sponsor Sharper Focus Wider Lens because it gives us an opportunity to highlight the talent here on campus, to let the local community and students and faculty faculty and staff exchange ideas about big topics. We never answer all the questions. We actually come up with more and the intent is that the dialogue will hopefully continue. On tonight, we will be talking about all about auto. And I say we, I'm going to exclude myself from that conversation. I do mean the panelists. We have Lisa Fine, a professor in the Department of History at the very end of the table. She has authored two books, The Souls of the Skyscraper, Female Clerical Workers in Chicago, 1870 to 1930, and the story of Rio Joe, Work, Kin, and Community in Autotown, USA. Her research interests include 20th century US, gender and women's history, and labor and working class history. She earned her doctorate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. To her immediate left is Tamara Reed Bush, an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Her focus is biomechanics and applying engineering techniques and principles to the human body. In 2017, she was named a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. That deserves a round of applause. She is the founding director of the MSU Biomechanical Design Research Laboratory, where she and her students apply engineering techniques to the principles of the human body. She earned her doctorate from Michigan State University. David Ferguson, to her immediate left, is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology. One of his research interests include a focus on the physiological stress placed on automotive race car drivers and pit crews. He has worked in racing for over 10 years with the top teams in NASCAR, IndyCar, Formula One, and IMSA. He earned his doctorate from Texas A&M. Immediately to David's left is Haydar Radha, a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He is the director of MSU's Connected and Autonomous Networked Vehicles for Active Safety, or CANVAS. Prior to teaching at MSU, he was a research fellow and consulting scientist at Phillips Research. He was also a distinguished member of the technical staff at Bell Laboratories. He earned his doctorate from Columbia University. And to my immediate right is Mark Wilson, a professor and program director of urban and regional planning in the School of Planning, Design, and Construction. His research interests include the social, economic, and political implications of technical change, including the internet and autonomous vehicles, with an emphasis on planning strategies and urban implications. His current projects include planning for industrial parks in Africa and the Middle East, mega event planning for world's fairs and Olympics, innovation and information technology access in Michigan, and the planning and knowledge, the planning of knowledge and innovation clusters. He earned his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. We ask all panelists to speak from their area of research and expertise. It is not up to them to make the connections. Um, we will do that together. 
and we also allow time after they've each presented for a bit of crosstalk if they desire to do so. And then our goal is to open up to the audience as quickly as possible. We do keep them to a time schedule, so please be mindful of that. You probably could sit and listen to each one of them independently for a lot longer than we allot them. Um, but the idea is that we do want to engage in the crosstalk. And with that, I will hand off to Lisa. Um. Good evening, and thank you for coming. Um, as you just um, probably realized, I'm the only lone humanist on this panel. <laughs> so I have a tall order here, a myriad of topics that relate to the human encounters with cars from the perspective of the humanities. Um, but I can't do everything. For example, I won't be discussing the ubiquitous road trip book, such as Jack Kerouac's um, On the Road, I won't be discussing um, the car in the final scene of Thel Thelma and Louise going off the cliff. Um, and I won't be discussing the wonderful music for cruising in cars. Um, there's so many wonderful humanistic topics related to cars that I can't be discussing. However, I will be discussing the car in history. And in this case, the car is part of 20th century history. This is significant. Very, very few people living before the, 20, the start of the 20th century had any contact with cars, and everybody in the 20th century, for the most part, was affected by the car. The car is a 20th century thing. You can't understand the history of the century without understanding the car and its many facets, and historians are trained to think about the long sweep of history, so for us, a, a development like that is fairly significant. Even that is a big history, and so because of my own interests, I'll be narrowing it down a bit. The reason that I was asked to be on this panel is that um, one of the organizers um, twisted my arm, John Beck, <laughs> but the other reason was because I wrote this book, The Story of Rio Joe, which was about the Rio Motor Car Company of Lansing, Michigan, between 1904 and 1975 and beyond. And beyond, it closed in 75, but beyond because it still exists, the car company exists in the hearts and the minds of the people that work there. And it's imprinted on the geography and the history of the city of Lansing. That's why we have Rio Town. So I don't study cars per se, but I study the effects of the industry on people and the places in which they live. Since I have only a few minutes, I'd like to present perhaps the most dramatic and the well -known, most well-known elements of the effects of the car on 20th century US history, um, and it's usually described as Ford and Fordism. So we'll shift our gaze to Detroit area for the first three quarters of the 20th century. The story of Ford and what came to be called Fordism is important and had far-ranging implications. Fordism describes mass production industry, and the Ford River, plant, Ford River Rouge plant was among the largest in the world one of the many in many massive industrial empires of Ford. The story was that the raw material went in on one end of the factory and finished cars came in on the other end, and that was not too far off. In the years before the building of these massive sites, cars were made in hours and in days, and there were only thousands of them produced a year. But by the 1920s, they rolled off every few seconds, and, the, and millions were produced every year. So Fordism described, Fordism described this incredible change in production. But it also described the way work had to change to make that kind of productivity happen. Sometimes it was called tailorization or rationalization, and it involved engineers and scientists dividing up the work into discrete motions, requiring executions in very small amounts of time. This was the pace of the assembly line, originally called progressive production. It radically transformed the lives of the now massive numbers of workers whose bodies were now ser serving the requirements of this stop uh, watch factory. Fordism not only brought about regimentation and control at the workplace, but in the early years of the 20th century, it was extended to many of the workers' non-work lives. And through Ford's famous sociological department, Ford extended a carrot to his workers. If you conform to the ideals of a wholesome family life, sobriety, religious observance, clean and orderly homes, then you can earn $5 a day, enough for the average worker to actually acquire the cars that they were helping to build. And these are titles of books that talk about this, um, and they use the terms human engineering and social control to describe 
exactly how these programs were implemented by members of the Ford Motor Company. If this sociological department, however, was the carrot enticing workers to conform, the service department at Ford was the stick. Workers, especially after the Great Depression and the New Deal, they wanted to start organizations, labor organizations, and they attempted to or organize the United Automobile Workers through the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Millions of auto workers clamored to join, these fa um, to join after the famous victory at the Flint sit-down strike in uh, Flint, Michigan. But because of the repression of the service department thugs, Ford was the last holdout in the auto industry to unionize. This is a famous picture of the standoff of what was called the Battle of the Overpass in 1937. There were auto unionists on the right. Walter Ruther, the famous soon-to-be president of the union, is wearing the watch chain, and the thugs are on the left. By the early 1940s, however, Ford was organized, and the UAW goes on to become one of the most progressive unions in United States history, establishing standards and patterns in collective bargaining that brought middle-class standards of living to auto workers and many, many others. This is Walter Ruther um, on the left, um, marching with Martin Luther King um, towards the right in Detroit before the famous march on Washington where he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Even though the rank and file did not always agree, the United Automobile Workers represented what is sometimes called social unionism or the liberal labor alliance of the mid-20th century, a very important progressive presence in American political life. But the uh, economics that um, were emerging by the mid to late 20th century began to strain this alliance. The oil crisis, stagflation, changes to the financial global economy, and many other developments of the 1970s brought cheaper auto import or imports into the United States market. Environmental regulations and automation altered the size and the nature of auto work. Economic nationalism emerged as a response for many automobile workers. In the 1980s, bashing Japanese cars sent a powerful message and provided an outlet for anger and frustration with changing times. In the 20th century, the auto changed life spaces as well in very, very profound ways. Um, I will only be able to simply introduce a couple of large topics around this, again, primarily related to Ford. Um, this is a beautiful painting from 1932 by the painter Charles Scheeler of the River Rouge plant and the river itself. Um, what this doesn't represent, however, was the fact that in 1932, the River Rouge also erupted into flames because of pollution. Um, the auto factories um, in this region and elsewhere brought massive pollution um, that brought about the burning of the river itself. And the River Rouge will actually burn again in 1969, so the problem wasn't solved. It has been frequently cited as the most polluted river in American history, and only in recent times, because of citizens' groups um, along the river that has started to come back. And this is a, an article from 2016. The auto industry along the Detroit River and its tributaries have certainly taken their toll on the environment. The other life space affected by the auto industry is residential space, and this has had a very troubled history in the Detroit area. While not true of all auto companies, some did hire African American workers, and this made Detroit the destination for many making the great migration from the South during and after World War II. This is a very famous picture from the early 1940s in response to this migration of African Americans to Detroit. The promise of auto work did not always extend to all citizens. Finally, um, the auto, particularly in Detroit and other cities like LA, profoundly transformed um, how we get around and how cities were organized to accommodate that. Even though we all love the ease and the convenience of highways, some did not benefit from this. Many couldn't afford cars, and without commensurate mass transit, they were left behind. In addition, these lovely highways and parkways were often built in poor neighborhoods that had been previously cleared of these communities, seen as impediments to progress. And then finally, homes contiguous to these highways lost value. These did not always benefit everyone in the city. So to conclude, Fordism, as represented by all of these trends that I've uh, shared with you, was a 20th century development and a phenomenon. 
and many of these have profoundly changed or are running out of steam in the last couple of decades. We perhaps live in a post-Fordist world. Hopefully we can build and drive our cars, but create a better world with these lessons from the past. Thank you. Okay, now you're gonna hear a very different topic from what Dr. Fine presented. Uh, I'm Timmy Bush, and I'm in the mechanical engineering department. So I'm gonna talk about how we look at the human body and the human body interface in the vehicle. So even though I'm in mechanical engineering, the principles we learn in, in engineering are what we use on the human body. So instead of looking at the car from a mechanic standpoint, we look at the human body from a mechanic standpoint. In particular, I'm most interested in what we call kinematics, and that's the motion of the body, which if you think about all of the bones and the rigid structures, it's a very complicated machine. Also, I'm interested in the forces, so the force interactions both internally and externally with the body and the device it interacts with. So you might say, how does this apply to the automotive area? Well, certainly we want to prevent injury while we're in a vehicle, whether um, it's in a crash or just uh, driving around in a small fender bumpers. We also want to know where the body is in the vehicle at all times because if we know that, then we can put safety structures around to prevent injury of the individual, like a seat belt. The seat belt is designed to go over anatomical structures that'll keep your body in place and can withstand load during an impact. Um, we're also interested in comfort. We spend a lot of time in our automobiles, at least many individuals do, and sitting in them for a long period of times, if it's uncomfortable, can also cause problems. Many of you may have back injuries or have had a back injury at one time, and you know that seating is one of the most painful things that comes when you have a back injury. And then we're doing a lot more with human body modeling now. So instead of uh, what they used to do is put a cadaver in a crash test situation and run a cr crash test with an actual body, now we're running simulations uh, using computers and we're mimicking the human body with that. So understanding the human body from a mechanic standpoint is extremely important. If you look over here to the left, whoops, mm -hmm. wrong, wrong way. There we go. To the left, you will see the Ford's most recent seat that has 30 different features for adjustment. 30 different things you have to adjust to get your seat comfortable, okay? So that's a far cry from some of the manual seats where you reach down and you just pull the seat forward or back and there's a lever where you recline the seat forward um, or rearward, right? 30 different features. So if you look at the headrest up there, which is a head support structure, it's actually not a rest, it's for a crash, it adjusts. The upper piece, which is the thorax piece, also adjusts, and those side pieces adjust in and out as well, as well as the lumbar, and there are cushion supports underneath your buttocks, underneath your thighs, and on the sides of your butts that adjust. So comfort is a big part of seating. And if you look at the um, picture just to the right of it, that's a cut view of an automotive seat, which is a mechanical structure. It has a pan underneath the bottom, which uh, acts as your suspension. Then there's a foam piece, which is part of the comfort profile. And then you have a trim cover. And along the back, you have an articulated piece, which is your lumbar support. So designing a seat requires that you know what the body looks like, how the body moves, and how the body should be supported, right? If you have a large pointy object in the middle of your back, that's not going to be very comfortable. Rather, you should have a smooth contour and it should come out in the lumbar region. Also to the right, we need to know where the occupant is. Um, belt placement, as I, as I mentioned, it also relates to vision, what you can see, and if you're a petite woman or if you're a tall man, what you can see out the windows or the instrument panels, as well as airbag placements. So all of those are related to human body positioning. So how do we look at that? 
Well, um, off to the left you see a camera and there are some re reflective markers down the back of an individual. You're probably all familiar with this technology in the movie industry, right? Animations and how they make the animations move like people move. Uh, Lord of the Rings was famous for this. They instrument people in body suits, have them move and have the motion captured by cameras and then they drive the computer simulations with those movements. So we don't quite do the animations, but we do look at how people move. Um, and at the bottom, you can see we have targets all the way down a person's spine. So of course, you can't put an individual in a seat with markers on their back, because one, it would be uncomfortable. Two, you couldn't see the markers with a camera. So we had to start by looking at body movements just in general. And then we could put an individual in a seat and we developed methods to define how the body moved. In other words, we can look at where the chest is, where the pelvis is, and if we know that, we know what's happening to the spine and how it's curving and how it's moving when you change your posture, right? Everyone's sitting up nice and straight right now because that's the best position for your spine. Okay, and off to the right, you can see um, the bottom right there is a simplified version because we don't want to track the movement of all the spinal markers. Rather, we just want to know what the thorax and pelvis are doing. So there's a whole methods assessment that goes with the movement analysis. And on the bottom, you may not think about this, but some people splay their legs. The taller you are, the more likely you are to move your legs to the side. There was no way to measure splay nor to define it. So that's another piece we've done in our lab. So you take these kinematics and on the left you see a prototype seat that was a precursor to that Lincoln seat with uh, uh, 30 different positions and it articulates with the body. It actually was a passive seat so you made it move like an office seat. And we have markers all along the human body so we could define where they moved, if they had to reach for an instrument panel, if they changed their posture, um, and where their head supports were. On the top, you see some of the force interactions. So those are someone's butt, okay? On the left and on the right, same person, different postures, same seat. And you can see on the left there, uh, orange spots, those are underneath the ischial tuberosities. So let me see if I can take my mouse. So this is the back of the butt, this is a thigh, and this is a thigh. And there are hot spots here that are a little orange. Those are underneath the buttocks. And if you look at this individual, they've splayed more, so they have more contact with the bolsters. Here, they have less thigh contact, so their legs are actually up, and they have more loading underneath the ischial tuberosities. Down here, we have a very different seat and a very different person. If you look off to the right, you can see a hot spot here. That's because that individual had their wallet in their pocket while they were sitting in the seat, right? So different shapes, different interactions, different levels of comfort, and different force distributions across the seat bottom. We can do the same thing for the seat back. That's um, some of the actual measurements we take that we use for body positioning. Now let me move into the modeling piece. So many of you have seen what a crash test model looks like. It looks like a human body, but that interaction comes with putting the material properties. So when you sit on a seat, your, your butt and your thighs squish, right? And depending on uh, how big of a person you are, how much adipose tissue you have, how much you work out, depends on how much your buttocks and thighs are gonna squish and the shape you're gonna get. So getting a computer model that represents that ability is very challenging. And right now, most of the material properties come from cadavers. And we all know that the cadaver um, interaction is going to be very different than an in vivo or a live human being. So we've developed a way, this is a crazy test seat we have in my lab. It's elevated off the floor um, about four feet. You have to step into it. And these slats move. Um, so we can completely remove a slat from the back and then we can measure the material properties underneath the buttocks. Then we can have the person stand up and we remove the front slat so we can measure the properties underneath the thigh. And what you see down here is a section of this where we have an instrument piece where we take, uh, it uh, measures the force, how hard you push, and then we can measure how far it moves. And what we're looking at is the different regions around the back of the buttocks and under the thighs. This is important for automotive seating, for office seating, and for medical seating, individuals who are in wheelchairs. So this is relevant material for many arrays of seating. And what we're looking at is what should we input into models to mimic the human body? So, 
men and women in different regions. So if we look here, we've started um, over here at the top of the butt, down the back of the butt, and then down the thighs. And the shape of these curves, um, blue is male, red is female. Um, in general, there's a lot of overlap between men and women, except here you see the blues shifted. Of course, you know, I had to put in a graph. Uh, it's, it's required when you're an engineer. You have to have one slide with either equations, which I thought would really, really bore you, or um, some data. So this is, as you apply the force, how much your thigh squishes. And if we map this with mathematics, we can define how much um, material properties and input those in for your computer model. Okay, I need to move along here. So what if you're not driving? Right? We no longer know how you're sitting in your seat then because you could be playing cards, facing one another. You could be um, reclined one way and another individual reclined another way. So how do we tr protect the human body when they, we don't know what their posture is? Right now, your posture is defined. Everyone's facing forward, everyone's belted in, and all the airbags are placed accordingly. How is that going to change when we have autonomous vehicles? I think your comfort will significantly improve, right? You could recline, you could even have a foot rest, you could have a monitor in the ceiling. But will you be able to stay as safe? And, and some arguments are, well, we don't need the airbags because autonomous vehicles will never get into a crash, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. So future possibilities. Um, we're getting censored from all different directions. They're talking about um, health assessment constantly and individuals wearing it in your clothing. So monitoring your heartbeat, monitoring your blood pressure, um, load and blood flow sensors in the seat pan or even cameras monitoring your vision to make sure you're not falling asleep, okay? So from monitoring from your ATM, you could be monitoring all the way to your car and then all the way home. All right, thank you. All right, good evening. I think I'm going to talk about something a little different about sitting in a slightly different type of car. Uh, so I'm Dr. David Ferguson, I'm the director of the Spartan Motorsport Performance Lab, and our goal really is to improve the performance of race car driver athletes. I just said something there that should trigger his thought is, are race car drivers athletes? Don't they just sit there? We just talked about sitting. Uh, I'm going to make the argument today that the sitting on this side on the right here, I get my mouse to work, is slightly different than the other type of sitting or the sitting that you're doing now. And one person that actually agrees with me is Ernest Hemingway, who made this quote, there are only three sports, bullfighting, motor racing, and mountaineering. All the rest are mere, merely games. So we got one humanities thing in the slide I tried to. <laughs> now, however, the human performance literature disagrees with me on this thought and that if you did a search for any research articles published on human performance of race car drivers since 1965, you'll find less than 60 articles ever published. Now, just to give you a little idea, I threw a little data up here from 2014, because I like this one. If you looked for, in one year, the amount of papers published on soccer or American football, or American football and soccer, you'd find 1,000 papers published each year. In comparison to motor racing, there's only three published that year. So that's kind of concerning to me. There's such limited evidence because you have these individuals that are exposed to high ambient temperatures in fire protective suits. To give you an idea, a closed cockpit race car like a NASCAR, uh, on average, will see temperatures as high as 140 degrees Fahrenheit for three hours at a time. They're exposed to very high gravitational loads during the race give you an idea, in a turn, it's not uncommon for race car drivers to experience four to six times the force of gravity placed on their body. I'll give you a little perspective. Those of you that might be interested in going to Walt Disney World, if you happen to visit Epcot, there's a ride called Mission Space. It actually is a centrifuge, very similar to the one NASA uses, and you have two choices. You can do the green option and do the orange option. The orange option exposes you to 2.5 times the force of gravity. There's four paragraphs of warning about what you will experience. You might experience lightheadedness, dizziness, nausea. And then if you do a Google search, you'll find a massive amount of people that have actually vomited after riding this ride. That's 
2.5 times the force of gravity. Drivers experience anywhere between four and six times the force of gravity every corner. And this is over a three to four hour period, okay? Now they have to do all this, be exposed to all these loads at 200 miles an hour and have to make split decisions, okay? So I'm a big fan of audience participation. So let's have a little fun today, all right? So let's, let's do a reaction time drill, okay? Well, I'm gonna start you off easy, okay? I'm gonna hit the button, a number's gonna pop up, okay? All you have to do is tell me if it's an odd or an even number. Even, right. Pretty easy, okay? What if we're at 60 miles per hour, okay? So we're on the freeway, um, slightly different, things can happen a little quicker. You have to tell me the second digit. Is the second digit an odd or an even number, all right? All right, we're, we're doing well, we can drive home today. <laughs> what if you're at the Indianapolis 500 going 220 miles an hour, okay? All right, so once again, odd or even number, but this time you're gonna tell me the third digit, okay? Third digit, odd or even. Uh, so some of you might be able to make the Indy 500, okay? So. I want to give you a perspective here. That was fun. We're in a nice air-conditioned room. You're comfortable. You're sitting there. When you're a professional race car driver and you climb into that car, you, we talked about sensors of what you can measure. We actually measured these on race car drivers. The minute that car enters track, your heart rate's going to go up to 170 beats per minute. Okay? You're going to be taking one breath every second. Your blood glucose is going to go up to 125 milligrams per deciliter just to fuel your muscles so you can hold yourself in the race car, all right? Your core temperature is going to go up to 103 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And if you do this for a three-hour race, you will lose seven pounds of sweat, okay? Now think about doing those reaction time drills under that exposure, okay? Now what's really interesting, though, is then you have to do it next weekend and the weekend after that, okay? So I think these drivers are extremely physically fit. I'm gonna call them athletes, all right? But however, like I said, the academic literature disagrees with me. So I always like to fight academia whenever I can. That's where I became a professor. So we decided to actually measure physical fitness, okay? So we got race car drivers from NASCAR, IndyCar, Formula One, IMSA, that's sports car racing, as well as rally racing. We brought them to the lab, by the way, the top elite drivers in the world walk through IM Circle just across the road there, okay? And our whole goal was to measure their physical fitness, all right? Now, the first thing we did was measure their cardiovascular fitness, so how healthy their heart is. If you've ever had to do an exercise stress test, this is very familiar to this. Um, I'm not gonna describe milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute, okay? Let's just say how healthy you are and how good of a runner you are, all right? So I wanna give you some context. Uh, my second favorite sport is hockey, okay? So this line right here represents the average cardiovascular fitness for NHL players when they enter the NHL, okay? Looks like they're doing pretty good, okay? Just as a side note, I've pulled female drivers out of this. If we wanna have a fun conversation about female drivers, we'll talk about that after. Next, we wanted to measure body composition. So what's their percent body fat, okay? So once again, we're gonna go to our favorite sport, Hockey, all right, so if you notice, NASCAR, IndyCar, and Formula One, where weight limit is really controlled, it's better to have a lower percent body fat, right? If you weigh less, you will go faster, okay? Next is strength, okay? So most of you will think of strength as how much weight you can lift, how much you can bench press, how much you can squat. Um, that's absolutely correct, but we like to look at it a little differently. Okay, we like to look at it as pure power output. So we use a test called a Wingate Cycle Ergometer. That's what our individual is using here in this picture, where we have them pedal for 30 seconds at their max wattage, and it's the longest 30 seconds of your life. Okay? Give you an idea. Here's our famous hockey players again. So as we look at this, we're starting to see a trend of these individuals are pretty fit compared to hockey players. I would call hockey players athletes. I would not certainly call them they're not athletes to their face. I don't want to experience that. So race car drivers have one other unique physical exposure towards them, and that's G-force loads, okay? Gravitational loading. Now, I'm gonna highlight one direction, and that's the vertical G load. That is the, the head to the butt loading, okay? 
So when you watch NASCAR, IndyCar, and they take the big banked ovals, these drivers are experiencing vertical G-loading. That's important to keep in mind because that's going to cause blood pooling in their legs. Okay? When you pull blood in your legs, you're going to take it away from your head and your heart. Do you want to go 200 miles an hour and not have the blood go into your head? I don't think so, right? So you need high G tolerance. Well, we can't really go out on the racetrack and measure that, so we use what's called a lower body negative pressure chamber. Um, here's one of our drivers. We seal him at the waist in this box, and then we use a very strong vacuum to pull air out of the box. That simulates G-loading. That causes blood to pull on the legs, and we see how long the race car driver can last in that, and that gives us a measure of G-tolerance. Okay? So we put them in the box, we pull the vacuum, we see how long they can last. All right? um, I have to apologize, I don't have data on hockey players and their G-tolerance, okay? Um, but I wanted to give you a perspective. So by the way, this line, if you were below this line, so any number, let me just pull it, appearing here, you're qualified for the Apollo Space Program. So we think these individuals are pretty fit, okay? However, like I said, there's very little data out there. So we want to take the stresses on these drivers, like we were talking about with sensors, and then actually train drivers. We actually offer a clinic. We offer a motorsport clinic where we train drivers to optimize their physical fitness to handle the race car. Um, it's worked out pretty well for us. We've won one NASCAR championship, four Formula One championships, recently won the 24 Hours of Daytona, and just this past fall we won the Baja 1000. Um, Real pain in my side is that we've only been able to do third at the Indianapolis 500, but I think we've got it figured out this year. So email me in May and let me know how it goes. All right? Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Hello, good evening. So uh, today I'll tell a little bit uh, about what's going on in the area of autonomous connected vehicles and in particular a little bit about what uh, we are in NMSU doing about it in terms of our research activities. So uh, I'll start with uh, what we call the popular narrative about autonomous vehicles and then uh, I'll move on to talk a little bit about some of the aspects of research that we are working on. Uh, Probably the most uh, uh, you know, exciting aspect of autonomous vehicle uh, is the prospect for enhanced safety. And you know, it's very unfortunate to talk about this today because of the news from Arizona. If you have not heard that there was a, an unfortunate uh, pedestrian fatality actually due to an Uber autonomous vehicle. Uh, but you know, I'll, I'll show you some numbers and you know, by far autonomous vehicle still has uh, much better safety record even with this very short you know, period of time in terms of conducting the research and so on than uh, manually driven uh, cars. Uh, many other aspects of the benefits of autonomous vehicle has to do really improving our life in terms of increasing productivity. So imagine you're driving from here or we should not say driving but sitting in a car from here to Chicago or to New York and then you'll be able to basically really uh, do all the things that you could do as you're sitting in your living room or in your library or in your office. Uh, so there is a great deal of uh, productivity, uh, productivity we anticipate by enabling this technology. Uh, of course, there are many other benefits and that's really probably not going to come from autonomous uh, vehicles themselves, but uh, if you combine it with connected vehicles. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, in a minute I'll make the distinction between autonomous and connected vehicles, but one of these benefits is better fuel economy. Uh, vehicles will be able to communicate with each other and they will be able to maximize uh, the benefit in terms of fuel or minimize the amount of fuel that uh, basically could be burned uh, because of their movement and because of the flow of tra traffic uh, in different parts, not only at an intersection, but different parts of an urban area. Um, of course, you know, there are all, always uh, the prospect of also, also of enjoying your ride as you're going, so you could be able to watch a movie or whatever, you know, your favorite uh, sport, uh, or probably take some measurements of uh, uh, different parts of your body while, you know, you're sitting as an occupant, you know, uh, not as a driver. So there is a whole, you know, uh, host of really uh, 
uh, societal and uh, both economic and safety uh, benefits that we anticipate from this new technology. Uh, of course, autonomous vehicle actually has been around for a while, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been in the Bay Area, there is a very good likelihood, actually, if you are just visiting the Bay Area, especially in the Silicon Valley, you might be bump into one of the Google cars that has been running, you know, millions of miles, actually, just going through testing. Actually, I, uh, by accident, I, you know, I experienced this myself. I was just driving in the San Francisco area one time, and this Google vehicle was just right next to me. So they doing... Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, they're collecting a lot of data trying basically to figure out all the different possible, you know, scenarios that they could encounter while having autonomous vehicle. Uh, this uh, particular graph actually has a lot of information but shows you some of the safety benefits of, to, of autonomous vehicle. And uh, the bottom line in here, uh, you know, if you compare the safety record of autonomous vehicle based on millions of miles that have been driven uh, compared to uh, human drivers, uh, by far, autonomous vehicle is much more safe. Now, just to give you a perspective, you know, the, the reason actually today the news from Arizona is big news because of the fact that autonomous vehicles are so safe. Uh, if it was, you know, a you know, manual driven vehicle that was involved in a pedestrian action of fatality, there is a very good likelihood you will not hear about it. And in fact, just to give you one number, there is around 75,000 either fatality or serious injury in the U.S. alone uh, for pedestrian uh, because of manual driven vehicle. So imagine 75,000 versus only one, uh, you know, fatality that happens this year. Uh, anyhow, this, this actually study, which is very thorough, I will not be able to go th through it, really shows, you know, some of these numbers. Uh, there is tremendous uh, economic, uh, you know, implication for enabling this technology and really the estimate in, in trillions of dollars is just so some of the services that we anticipate to happen for autonomous, you know, the, you know for example, autonomous uh, Uber or autonomous, you know, ca uh, car sharing, car riding type of services. And again, there is a fair amount of information here. And here it shows you actually the different parts of the, of the country where the, the benefits is anticipated. A lot of it has to do with, with urban areas. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, we, uh, autonomous vehicle going to be enabled, really a whole host of services we probably cannot imagine today, but this is in fact right now a, a test that's going on, uh, collaboration between Ford and Domino's for autonomous uh, uh, pizza delivery. So one day you could basically just order it and autonomous car will just bring you the pizza right to your door, but unfortunately you'll still have to go to the door and open it and get the pizza probably. Maybe there'll be a robot bring it to the door. We'll, we'll find out. Uh, so I'll say a few words about uh, our program, Canvas. Uh, so the centerpiece of actually our research is we actually have an autonomous vehicle platform uh, that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, the vehicle is equipped with state-of-the-art sensors. Uh, in particular, we have uh, cameras, we have radars, and we have this very exciting technology that is uh, it's a laser sensor, which is known as LADAR. Uh, it's basically, you could think about it as a laser version of, of radar. Basically, the technology is based off having a laser beam, very low power, it's, it's completely harmless, that uh, you know, sends the environment by shooting some you know, laser beams and then collecting data in order to figure out you know, what really the obstacles that are in front of the vehicle. Uh, this is some of the areas we're focusing on in MSU. Uh, one particular area which is very exciting, which is we call situational awareness. Uh, situational awareness is really about getting the vehicle and building artificial intelligence and in the brain for the vehicle such that the vehicle is capable of recognizing its environment, not only in terms of pedestrian and other vehicles and uh, bicycles and w what other you know, dynamic or static objects around it, but also to recognize, for example, the pedestrian is actually a child walking by him or herself, because that has a very tremendous uh, implication on how the vehicle has to react. Because then if it's a child, for example, if walking without the supervision of adult, then that child could be crossing the, the street. And we human, as you know, driver, we actually react to that very naturally and we have that capacity. So we're trying to get the vehicle to that level of comprehension in terms of recognizing its environment. Of course, there is uh, many aspects of you know, building the vehicle in a, in a very economic way, uh, in a cost-effective way, and also we're trying to enable the vehicle to drive anywhere, anytime. 
And one of the wonderful things we're doing, and I'm assuming we have the benefit of doing that, is really testing autonomous driving in fourth season. So uh, we've been specifically targeting snow. So we love it when we have a snowstorm or blizzard because we take the vehicle action and drive it around. Um, uh, th this is also show you actually some of the technology areas that unfortunately we don't have time to talk about, but there are a whole bunch of buzzwords in here. Some of it's known as sensor fusion. How are we going to bring all these different uh, sensor uh, technologies together in order to enable the vehicle to recognize in the environment? We talk about cameras, radars, and lidars. Uh, also, there is a, a, a very important area in machine learning known as deep learning. This is uh, actually an artificial intelligence area that's been growing in importance and it has implication not only in autonomous driving but anywhere from biology and finding uh, you know drugs for different kind of diseases and so on so there is a very interesting multidisciplinary research going on in this area actually within msu right now uh, this is our vehicle actually we have showcased it uh, so far in a couple of major events including the international uh, detroit auto show uh, both in 2017 and 2018 we have received a great deal of actually attention of having you know, anywhere from uh, Governor Snyder, the senators, you know, people from the media. Uh, and uh, it's been really kind of a very uh, exciting ride, if you will, uh, you know, going through that experience and working in this area. Uh, I want just to show you an example of uh, LIDAR sensing. This is actually sensing uh, uh, the campus and MSU here in the West Circle. And you can see some of the iconic building, uh, like the MSU library. And, uh, Bowman Tower and so on. Uh, another interesting thing I just mentioned that we're actually driving the vehicle in the snow and in fact so far we've had a couple of very successful uh, autonomous driving in the snow. Uh, it's a very limited exper experiment but it's really showed you the, some of the tremendous capability of actually driving in the snow. I had this experience actually where uh, we ch I challenged my grad students to see if they could drive uh, in this particular uh, racetrack that we took the vehicle uh, to do the testing and and so on, and actually the, the vehicle was capable of controlling uh, the, the artificial intelligence of the autonomous vehicle was driving better than my grad students. So uh, one of the very exciting research we're doing is recognizing different objects. This work actually been done by my colleague in computer science and engineering, uh, Professor Jean Manglou. You can see in here, this is on campus, right at the cross section by the engineering building. Uh, uh, you know, the vehicle has to recognize all the different pedestrians, if they're on bicycle, if they're on motorcycle, or just crossing, and uh, it's very interesting and important technology, actually. We're not there yet, by the way. Uh, this technology, at best, is about 97% accurate. That means, you know, you still have 3%, you know, missing uh, pedestrian, and that's where we need to perfect the, the, the technology. So um, um, I just want to share with you one more thing, which is basically uh, we're getting a second vehicle. This is something being donated to us by GM. And, and actually, MSU is only uh, one of six schools in the United States that was selected to participate in this GM, uh, Society of Automotive Engineer competition, where the students are actually going to work for three years to enable this uh, Chevy Bolt uh, to become autonomous. With that, I'll uh, hand it off to, to Mark. Thank you very much. Okay, is this on? Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about another stage in, in the autonomous uh, vehicle experience, and that is what happens when they become common? How do we prepare for a new technology? Uh, and one of the lessons from looking at new technologies in cities is the engineering is often very well advanced and analyzed, and the social context is often ignored. Uh, and so social science, scientists have a responsibility to think about how these new technologies uh, will, involve, will evolve. The first point I want to make when we talk about cities and transportation is that cities and transportation are closely linked that the nature of the cities we have is very closely tied to the dominant transportation we have. So when the best we could do is walk, our cities were designed for walking. Uh, when the best we could do is public transportation of subways and trams, our cities were designed for those forms of transportation. When we get to the automobile, our cities change, but we force the shape of the city to adhere to the technology. 
So the question for urban planners is, what does it mean for the future of the city if autonomous vehicles become common? What does it do to our quality of life? What does it do for the way we live? And can our cities retrofit themselves so that the new transportation modes, in fact, work with the metropolitan areas we have? We've seen narrow cities, especially in Europe, trying to deal with traffic. We'll have the reverse soon of automobile-based cities managing with autonomous vehicles. So one of the things that uh, I think is interesting in planning is that we often don't think about the social context of new technologies until they are on our doorstep and they are part of our lives. And we've seen this with the original automobile, we see it with the uh, internet, we see it with uh, renewable energy. They're here, they're being used, they're being adopted, and then we start to think about how we can, can manage those technologies. Uh, I would argue that as new technologies evolve, they move from an engineering field to a social field. And often the challenges of technologies are, in fact, social and political and economic. Think of the internet. The issues of the internet have moved beyond simply engineering to the realm of society and how society deals with, with those technologies. Another challenge when we plan is that the technologies are invisible to so many people. Uh, we sort of are in this little bubble where we are sort of aware of what is coming, but then you go into the broader society and we've just surveyed a thousand people in Michigan about their experience and understanding of autonomous vehicles and it's, it's very limited. Uh, there has not been a lot uh, of analysis undertaken at, at that level. So we see the need to understand these new technologies so we can think about what they might mean for cities in the future. And the futures of new technologies are not universally recognized. Everyone will see in the new technology something that is appealing or something that is frightening. Uh, and the message I am trying to get out is that we have choices to make. New technologies are presented to us. We have choices about how they can be assumed, uh, uh, they can evolve, how we can develop our society to accept, reject, modify what those technologies can bring. Which is, brings me to disruption. Technologies are disruptive in many cases. Uh, and I came to look at autonomous vehicles from 20 years of looking at the internet as a technology that was changing how we lived. We also looked at renewable energy and how it is changing the landscape. So if you're old like me, you can think of the pre-internet era. You can think of what Grand River looked like in terms of retailing, in terms of the jobs people did at MSU. They're very different today because of the role of the internet. So if we start out by saying, well, automobiles led to the remaking of cities, the internet is disrupted urban life. It has changed where we work, how we work, where and how we shop, uh, and how we get entertainment. Uh, we are now confronting the fact that shopping malls will become increasingly vacant, that there will no longer be a role for them. Yet shopping malls are often the center of many communities that identify their community by the mall or by the center, by the retailing center. So this is a huge disruption. Um, same thing with, uh, with energy. We are not generating energy in the same way anymore. It is disruptive. The question then is, well, what happens to our cities with these disruptions? What happens over the next 30 or 40 years? There's a lot of factors to take into account. It's very difficult to predict. How will the public, how will we react? Uh, will we adopt? Will we accept? Will we resist? Will we demand changes to those technologies before we will use them? Will we shift from the owned vehicle to uh, the shared vehicle? How much road space will we need? Will there be more vehicles? Will there be fewer vehicles on the road? What happens to, to parking? 
What happens to your household garage? How much sports equipment can you store in it before you find that if there's no vehicles, you have all this space that you may in fact want to use or you may not or you rent out? But what happens to planning when not every garage is used? What happens to the parking ramp at MSU if it's not needed? How do we plan and use those facilities? What happens to signs if they're no longer needed because the vehicles can find their way? What happens to residential housing? Is this an opportunity for us to redesign how people live? What happens to the tax and payment systems we have for roads? What happens to parking fines? What happens to speeding tickets? All of these are implications of what these new technologies will do. Will it lead to more sprawl or will it lead to less sprawl? So when we think about these things, uh, urban planners have dreams and they have nightmares. Uh, and what I find is that you see in new technologies what you want to see. And sometimes we don't remind ourselves that others may not share that vision. So what do urban planners see when they see autonomous vehicles? We get very excited, uh, we see this positively, um, because this is a more efficient, more sustainable transportation system. Hopefully it moves us away from fossil fuels. Uh, we see lots more ride sharing, fewer trips, less parking, uh, much better organization of city space, uh, the need for fewer roads. We see the opportunity to increase density, to attack sprawl. So the test is I look at the vehicle and I see wonderful things. But then I also have nightmares about what this new technology could mean for us. Because it could mean that people will not share and that they want to own an autonomous vehicle and it will drive them to MSU and then it will go home and then a few hours later it will come back and get you and go home. Uh, so we have many more journeys uh, rather than uh, we have today. Uh, what about the marginalization of, uh, of populations? New technologies can be used as weapons. We can use them or forces can use them to marginalize, uh, to improve the quality of one group's experience and to attack the quality of another. So these new technologies can be differentially applied or used across our society. And is this going to be a missed opportunity again? Because when the automobile came, we embraced it and we did everything we could to accommodate it and often didn't really think about the long-term implications. And so I think that there's a missed opportunity here if we are going to rethink our cities because one of the fundamental shapers of urban life is going to change. Uh, are we going to miss the chance to make our cities uh, more sustainable or more livable? So two questions that come up when we, we talk about this. Um, is everyone aware of the issues? Are we well informed enough to make decisions about what autonomous vehicles mean for us in terms of how we live? And the second question is, who has the responsibility to educate and inform us about these new technologies? Do we take it upon ourselves? Is there some source of knowledge? Hopefully the university will be one. But how do we find out? How do we help make decisions? How do we sh help shape what our society will be like because of these technologies in the future? So a, a brazen plug at the end. Uh, MSU is having what we think is one of the first national conferences on the social impact of autonomous vehicles in uh, May. Uh, we have so much expertise at MSU, both on the engineering side, that is looking at the evolution of the technology, and also on the social side. We found over 50 professors who are working and interested in the social impact of autonomous vehicles. So we have a huge expertise here that we're hoping to leverage around what the future agenda will be like. So we have a group in planning, design and construction, the Autonomous Futures Group, looking at what autonomous technologies mean for urban life. But I ask all of you to think about what does it mean for you? How do you think about what the future will be like if you had the option of using an autonomous vehicle? Thank you.
Okay, John, I think it's official. You have finally stumped me. All right, I'm going to tell everyone what I think I heard, and there may not be as many connections that I made as I'm usually able to. We'll see where we land. Um, and in some of them, I kind of threw in things that came to mind, so there may be a little levity in here. But when we were looking at the car in, the, in 20th century history and really bringing in the humanist perspective, it was thinking about what's the effect of industry, and you might broaden it, on people, industry and technology, on people and where we live. And it's a question that we shouldn't really leave for the historians, right? That we should be, if you circle all the way back to Mark, we should be thinking about the impacts of technology and industry on ourselves and future generations at all the time all the time and with Ford and Fordism the whole idea of dividing work into discrete actions and thinking about the regimentation of control are we not now cycling back to a new way of thinking about how we organize ourselves in the workplace and what are the types of things we do and what should we do versus what should robots do and, and other forms of support what was the, at the heart of some of the conversation was human engineering, social engineering, and engineering engineering, right? And, and how they're all interwoven. But really this whole idea of how the auto industry changed our perspective on class and changed our approach to class. You have the great migration in the Midwest because of Ford, and on the East Coast you have neighborhoods being torn apart because now we have to build highways to get people to cool places and we'll build bridges that are too low for buses to get people out to the new cool places, right? And so what does that mean? What's the impact? And the disruption that that brings forth. But also how we saw the emergence of unions. And so as industry changes, as technology changes, we have to think about ourselves as workers and how do we acknowledge everybody's place in that spectrum. And then Tammy talked about the human body interface in the vehicle and the motion of the body. And it was interesting to think about, you know, how do we design cars to recognize the limitations of the human body so that we can be more responsive to both ourselves and what's happening in the vehicles and injury prevention. This whole idea that we created crash dummies so that we don't have to put a real person in the car and now we might not even need the crash dummies. We now have technology protecting the crash dummies and getting us even more information and better information. And, and Tammy didn't say we're protecting the dummies, that was mine. But this whole idea is that we continue to move forward and move each thing out. But it's the movement from leisure, right? Cars came about as a leisure industry into a form of transportation, into, in many respects, a second home. Lots of people spend good chunks of their time in their vehicles. And so how are we responsive to those changing dynamics and what does it mean for the human body? And the importance of valuing experimentation to evolve what is essentially an assistive device. That's all a car is, right? It helps us, it assists us get from one place to another more quickly, not always more efficiently, you know, with less effort sometimes, and what does that mean? But what impact will autonomous vehicles ultimately have on safety and comfort? And then David, so David's the one with the levity for me, because when he was describing everything, the measuring physical fitness of race car drivers, I was just imagining, how do we feel when we're driving at really high speeds, right? And that the traffic is pushing you along, and you're like, okay, wait, I'm in the slow lane, but you want me to go fast. What does that do to us psychologically? And, and what happens to us when we're driving and a car is too close on a curve and we're veering? And so just thinking about what we face in our day-to-day -day driving and then what's asked of race car drivers, right? And the importance of thinking about the stressors of the temperature and the tightness of the space. And even though it was confined to race car drivers, you could imagine what that would say to us in other aspects of life. And, and immediately before he went to the astronaut example, I'm like, okay, four to six Gs, we're, t we're already talking about, you know, 
people going into outer space and what does that mean and how does the body adapt and yet people are choosing to do this as their career every day in a way that we don't think about it and, and what does that mean and how do we raise that up and I think we do want to challenge David to tell us about the fun conversation with female drivers um, but also the importance of technology and research in advancing how we interact with society with these new and emerging vehicles and, and really thinking about what that means and the understanding the impact on people and culture because um, Mark alluded to it a little bit it, it begins to become again who can take advantage of the new technologies and who gets left behind even before you get to the cities and what happens to the communities we live in as Hader was talking about autonomous vehicles and opportunity for enhanced safety and increased productivity, it harkened back to the role of commuter trains, right? And, and where there was a time where instead of getting in the car, I'm going to get on the train and I'm going to do my work or I'm going to rest and relax there. And we already have people doing much of what we say autonomous vehicles will allow us to do while they're driving also so we can see how this would enhance safety but what wasn't clear to me is autonomous vehicles are they a bigger boon to safety for auto pedestrian accidents or would it be vehicle to vehicle where where do we really see the biggest increase or decrease there but are we ready to trust you know are, are we ready to trust that the technology is not going to fail are we ready to trust that someone's not going to find it funny just to hack into our vehicle, let alone malicious? And, mm -hmm. and have we put the technology and the people in place so that we have appropriate cybersecurity for our autonomous vehicles? And some of you will get this. How far are we from the Jetsons reality? <laughs> you know, what, what comes next? But also, how does this compare with when we went from human drivers into mass transit and thinking about walking away from, you know, horse and buggy or bicycles or walking, what does this transition mean for us? And how do we get these vehicles to recognize the environment? It's the same question with robotics, right? And, and how do we get these different technologies to recognize what was going on? And John always does a fabulous job of figuring out the order because Mark brought us back around to the question of, are we really thinking about the difference that this makes? And you know, if you think about where we live, we have more people in cities now than in rural areas. And are we reshaping cities once again? We have so much built environment, how do we reshape cities? And we already have brownfields. Are we going to have a new version of brownfields because we now have parking structures and roads and infrastructure that doesn't meet the needs of the changing technology and how do we address that but also how can we be proactive in managing those technologies and thinking about the socio-political and economic long-term impacts and how do we ensure that it's not just the social scientists who are interweaving all of that so that was kind of my you know 50,000 foot here are how these are all connecting for me um, want to give the panel an opportunity if you heard something from each other or something that I threw out there that you want to respond to or and definitely let David tell us the fun factoid so I uh, is this still on guys so I, I baited you a bit with the, the female driver story um, so, uh, I care, any race fans in the audience? Big race fans? Okay, so, so everyone knows Danica Patrick, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Danica came through our lab probably about six years ago, and she's a phenomenal athlete. If you ever look at her, she is a strong, powerful athlete, right? And I think there's, she's done some amazing things for racing, but there's always been this stigma that came out that Females can't be race car drivers. I'm going to give you the reason why that is. So about probably three years ago, a comment was, and I'm going to give you the direct quote, don't beat me up afterwards. Okay, That's, I'll tell you the story, just don't beat me up afterwards. So a investigator was evaluating female race car drivers. And he made the comment that due to their reproductive cycle, they cannot be re, uh, race car drivers because they get too hot in the car. So I mentioned the high thermal loads in the race car, and this comment was out there, and it started to get picked up 
by the mainstream media, and I said, well, that's really interesting. Um, we've actually got the equipment to measure that. Let's actually look at this story and see if it's true. And so we did that. Um, we worked with Danica. Uh, we worked with several other very famous female drivers. And lo and behold, female drivers do not get as hot as males in the race car, okay? So they're actually cooler. And I'll, I'll show you a little fun factoid of data here. So they, they did want to talk about their reproductive cycle a bit. So I'll talk about it. If we go back to their G tolerance, higher estrogen actually lets you have higher G tolerance. So if you want to be a better race car driver, be a female. Um, there's probably some socio-cultural reasons why they're not as successful. But so we did this study. We got kind of the data together. And we're actually we're getting ready to publish it. And then on Twitter, the uh, the female liaison for the FIA, which is the regulating body for all of racing, came out and said, females are not strong enough to drive race cars, they should do something else. Um, so we then didn't publish the paper, we collected more data and are going to cite that little fun study, that Twitter post right there. Um, so yeah, in a couple months, look for a study coming out saying that female drivers actually fatigue less and are better on the big ovals than the males, and they don't get as hot. <laughs> So are you going to call that female's rock? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Any other comments from the panel? So uh, regarding your question about the, the safety aspect, is it for vehicle, vehicle? Uh, so actually the, the most maybe uh, cited statistic people usually talk about when they try to highlight the safety of autonomous vehicle uh, is you know, there are close to probably 40,000 fatalities in the U.S. because of vehicle-vehicle uh, accident. And uh, the staggering statistic is that 95% of those fatalities are due to human error. And the hope is once you have artificial intelligence and, you know, actually robots controlling the vehicle, then uh, virtually all of that 95% will basically, you know, go away. Uh, so that's really the, the target and that's the hope and that's the vision. So hopefully that's right. the case. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel? If not, we will turn it over to John to moderate from the floor. I'm actually going to step aside, but I'm still in the room. John, okay. you're Okay. So if you have a question, raise your hand. But let me just throw one out while I'm looking for hands. And that is that as I think about the fact that in Washington, D.C., where I do a little bit of visiting, there are these now bikes that you take from one place and leave at another. Just put your uh, credit card in. Are we going to see autonomous vehicles actually slim down to be maybe individual uh, kind of vehicles in a way where I'm going to be able to pick it up at one corner, put my credit card in, drop it wherever I do, and then it'll be picked up or someone else will use it where they find it. Are we going to change the way we think about automobiles? So any of you can comment. Sounds like a more question. <laughs> um, no, I, I was thinking that uh, I, I read the Sydney Morning Herald uh, every evening and I read it tonight and an autonomous bike hit a Tesla. It was an unattended <laughs> autonomous bike um, that a Singaporean company is bringing to Sydney and it hit a Tesla and they said it was an act of God, according to their insurance company. <laughs> it was not an accident. Uh, so to me, what is challenging is that I have great respect for the engineers and that they can predict when things will happen. You deal with people and society and things are incredibly messy and yeah. complicated and gray and difficult to judge. So we have hopes. And so I think that this is a real sort of Rorschach test that you ask someone to look at the autonomous vehicle and I'm thinking fuel efficient, fewer journeys. And someone's saying, I'm going to live an hour and a half from Lansing, I'm going to have my coffee, I'll watch a movie, and I don't care how much I move back and forth because I'm comfortable. And so we would like to see the slimming down the efficiency. But I think we have to keep reminding ourselves there's lots of choices here to be made. Uh, who's making the choices and how are those choices being made? Uh, any other comments before we have a, a question? Okay, I had a question for Dr. Radha. Well, David, you can argue this out. Could you program this autonomous vehicle to win at Daytona? Uh, 
Maybe that's more his question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, well, I'll chime in on that. Um, maybe. I think we might see that. Uh, I'll tell you this. If you've ever sat in the Formula One paddock pit, all you hear is the engineers telling the driver how to drive the race car. Um, and in fact, if you're a race fan, you know Kimi Raikkonen. They tried to tell him how to drive the race car. He replied over the radio, shut up, I know what I'm doing. Um, so I think you're, you're not far off. I think we like to hit, see the human side of it. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting social culture here. This is not, <laughs> keep the physiologist from talking about that. It's not good. Um, I think um, it's definitely possible. The engineers build the car for the optimal racing line to go the fastest. And I, we're probably going to get very close to driver aids, driver supports. So in 92, the Williams F1 team basically invented traction control and it was amazing. They won the whole thing, right? What F1 do? They pulled it off, right? They said there was too, too much of a competitive advantage. So we may see it get close to that, but then I think we might see the regulations strip it away to see more of the drivers on it. If you want to chime yeah, on so. it. You know, I, I, I show you the example actually of driving on the snow and I mentioned that in fact the autonomous vehicle is probably more capable of avoiding slippage and you know those kind of things than human drivers. So I, I'm, I really believe that you know the, the level of artificial intelligence could reach a point where you could actually envision those kind of uh, you know ambitious you know uh, futuristic if you will uh, you know, targets that uh, I don't think is far-fetched, frankly, you know. But I, I don't think that probably is something going to happen in five years, maybe it's more, you know, 15, 20 years, you know. <laughs> yeah, I have a series of uh, thoughts and questions. Um, I understand. <laughs> okay, um, given the fact that U.S. DOT doesn't pay Michigan as much as it pays other states, so we have bridges falling down, we have uh, fracking causing parts of the land to drop. Um, we have uh, potholes that you could bury a cow in. Um, will your autonomous vehicles be able to detect these things coming? Actually, yes. In fact, right now, the, one of the wonderful things about the LADAR, the laser technology I was mentioning, uh, that it is capable, in fact, on detecting uh, potholes and uh, assuming they're deep enough, of course, which is, by definition, that's a pothole. Uh, and then, actually, you could adjust the suspension of the vehicle such that you will not even feel that you are going over a pothole. So that um, just comes almost inherent with having LADARs and these laser sensors on the vehicle. Um, so my question is more of a, have you guys, in terms of with dealing with the car and the seat, have you, like, con into thinking about the fact that the population has become more obese and has that affected how you design the chairs and then also do you think that autonomous vehicles might increase the chance of people being more obese in the future because of it? So um, yes, very aware that the population is becoming more obese. Um, the automotive seats, though, are still designed and have specifications predominantly for the 50th percentile male occupant. So um, they haven't taken into account in the automotive industry obesity, but they certainly have in the office industry. And um, those force deflection tests that we're looking at, uh, that's one area where we can make a difference in seat design is in model repl replication. Um, obesity comes in many shapes, so you don't gain the weight in just one area. Um, so it's not only a increase in BMI, it's also a deformation piece or a shape change piece. So yes, that's a rich area for research and that's one we're in, but um, there hasn't been a lot of accommodation uh, at least in the automotive industry for obesity. You tend to find um, larger individuals, people pick their vehicle styles based on their body size and shape in some instances. Some vehicles are uh, much more accommodating for a very short petite woman and some uh, have flat wider seats uh, more accommodating for a taller larger individual. Um, something I like n I noticed that was neglected to mention was responsibility for accidents in self-driving cars. I don't know if there's any thought on that and who'd be responsible. Uh, 
Well, it, it's, it's part of the fact that so many sectors lag when it comes to understanding what will happen, because one of the crucial uh, factors when it comes to driving will be insurance. And so how the insurance industry responds to autonomous vehicles will be interesting. They're, they're much safer. But what about people that want to be autonomous during the week and on the weekend they want to drive themselves? Uh, what about people that uh, use their autonomous vehicles in, or try to use it in dangerous ways? Can the technology hold them back? The industry is just now beginning to think about what the future holds, but there's, n there's a lot of data on testing, but there's not a lot of data yet on autonomous vehicles sharing the road with everything else for the insurance industry to address in its terms. So I think that this has become more pointed because of the speed of change and the way that the internet in 20 years has brought so much change. The speed with which autonomous vehicles are advancing is outstripping our ability to come to terms with the social context of what it means. And it, it will take a while for everyone to be involved enough to, to make a decision. Uh, but I think it's really interesting that we may well find that the insurance industry holds a key to how a lot of this will unfold simply because of what they are willing to insure and not insure. Um, I would just probably echo some of what Mark said. Is, is uh, you know I, I, the whole model actually for owning vehicles probably going to change? And uh, OEM, you know, the big uh, companies like Ford and GM, they're almost preparing for that because they anticipate, especially in urban areas, that oh, it's already happening now. Uh, it's really you know owning a vehicle is not going to be the norm in the future, and you know vehicle will be shared among you know you know, large number, you know, it's almost like, I mean, you, you know about zip cars and, you know, those kind of companies is going to become like an autonomous zip car or, and people basically would just, you know, a uh, whole bunch of, so who's going to insure that? I mean, is, is uh, and if you get into an accident, whose responsibility is it? And is it the responsibility of the manufacturer? Is it the responsibility of the occupant? Is it the responsibility of maybe some other third uh, party that have contributed to the design. On so it's, it's a pretty open-ended question. But I do have a question for you. You are the only person I know who owns an autonomous car. So... Um, <laughs> I don't own it. It actually belongs to MSU. Okay, okay, but well, who insure? Is it insured as a regular it's, vehicle? It's, it's actually insured like a regular vehicle, yeah. yes. Okay, um, I understand demographically that the people under 30 want to live close to where they work. They don't want to be sitting in a car for an hour and a half commute every day. Um, and so if that seems to be a large part of the people who might have money, even though they'll have a lot of education debt, um, who will buy these cars? I mean, I know people who still don't own a cell phone. You know, so you got early adopters, late adopters, um, follow the money. And in terms of who will educate with technology, it's always the people who are selling the vehicle, right? Well, in, in some societies, it's who sells the vehicle. In other societies, the, the government may well feel a responsibility for education. It, it depends upon the, the context. Thank you so much. I have a question for Lisa. Um, it seemed to me that a lot of the comments really have to do with the car in American society, in particular, though obviously there's implications for elsewhere in the world. Um, from your perspective as an historian, Lisa, and your um, comments about how the introduction of the car and its wide use sort of changed American culture earlier, um, what kind of questions would you have us be thinking about in terms of the implications for American life and American culture of the other end of the table here, the autonomous vehicle? Because I suspect from your point of view as an historian, as you said, looking at the long view um, and having the benefit of really thinking seriously about what the car has meant for American society to date, what should we be thinking about in terms of implications on culture and our society? Right. Um, historians famously never predict. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not predicting anything. But I will just give you some benefit of insights about the past to whatever usefulness they might be. Um, 
I, it was not um, by accident that I started with uh, allusions to cultural um, symbols. The car is a cultural symbol for freedom in the United States. It is being on the road. It is being in control of your own destiny. Um, you think about it in the same vein, not so much as the internet. It's not a disruptive technology. It's a personal possession like a gun. And Americans like their personal possessions that are, allow them personal autonomy and freedom. So make of that what you will. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, the other thing is that technologies, the history of technology, and I've done a little work on this as well, um, show, all of you have seen Blade Runner, right? New technologies don't replace old technologies. They all exist side by side, right? So we might have this wonderful new technology coming. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to adopt it, take it, use it, and abandon what has existed before. Things exist simultaneously together. Um, cities have multiple ways that people get around. They still do. There are places that still have trolleys. There are places that still have mass transit. There are still places where people use bicycles. So it's going to be a new option, clearly, but it's not going to supplant, I, I would suggest, because it's not the history of technology that one technology completely supplants all the rest that have come before it. So. Well, since I happen, and I'm going to ask uh, Hader to comment in a second, but I just have to tell you as a historian, uh, one thing that I always thought, thought was an interesting factoid is that Hitler actually used more horses going into <laughs> Russia than Napoleon did. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that we have a problem in terms of understanding what's often called the persistence of the old mm -hmm. rather than the fascination with the new. Hader? Right, yeah, just to follow with, uh, what Lisa just said, it's, uh, it's really, I, from an engineering point of view, the most challenging aspect of actually designing the vehicle is worrying about this transition era from the time where time is vehicle really going to, you know, become something that you could buy and people could, you know, uh, you know, could have ownership of. And then having that mix of manual driven vehicle an autonomous vehicle. Autonomous vehicles actually come with different level of what you call autonomy. So some of it you could control it with, you know, at some time, some time, uh, you know, some of it you have zero control to the extent there is no even a steering or pedal. So that heterogeneous type of environment is, uh, is, is actually from an engineering point of view is the most challenging in terms of how do you design something that's going to be operating and has to deal with, you know, uh, human factor issues and human decision and the computer really has no control over the other vehicle that's driven by the human. And it's, it's, a, it's frankly, it's mind-boggling, you know. It's much easier if everybody switched to <laughs> a tiny vehicle, you know, but we know that's not going to happen. Okay, other hands? Let me see other hands. Okay, I'm coming your way. As I've often pointed out, this is an exercise program for older, chubby uh, faculty members. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, first of all. Um, is there a place for uh, the high-end, high-performance vehicles, other than on a racetrack, uh, in the future, as you see it, uh, for anybody who wants to buy one, along with autonomous vehicles? In other words, I guess a better way, let me rephrase that. Will there be autonomous vehicles, would you predict, uh, that have more high performance sort of characteristics? Maybe a better way to put that. So um, I think uh, th it's an excellent question, actually. I, I think we need to really make a distinction between a couple of aspects of the technology. So the, the core aspect of autonomous vehicle, that when we say really something autonomous or the vehicle is going to be autonomous, we're really basically converting a mechanical uh, thing, which is the regular vehicle right now, uh, to autonomous literally by mimicking the human brain. So the main aspect of the technology is really this artificial intelligence and the brain aspect that we bring into the vehicle. All the other aspects like high performance, that could continue or could you know, basically continue to progress from an engineering point of view. And you could have the combination of both progressing the artificial intelligence and the brain part, and then the mechanical and the high performance part. 
So these things could really, you know, uh, coexist and they both could get improved and one of them could be better than the other in terms of how much I had in terms of technology. So, you know, the short answer is yes. I just want to make sure that we recognize actually we're talking about pretty distinct aspects of technologies here that, you know, we're really dealing with. I'll chime in on that as well. So probably about, I think, oh, three, four years ago, Porsche, Ferrari, and McLaren released what they call the ultra cars, and they're actually all hybrid design. And uh, at the time, the chairman of Porsche said, we think the automobile is going to go kind of the way of the horse. Okay, so I'm speaking like a historian now, that's never a good thing either. But if you go back, everyone used to have a horse to get around, right? Is the horse still around? Yes, absolutely, but it's mainly for the enthusiast, okay? Um, I think we're going to start to see the non-autonomous vehicles go that way as well. We might get more of the pure driving experience for those that want it. Um, but likewise, if you, I'll, I'll chime back to racing. If you look at racing over the years, that technology has always advanced the automotive technology. So I mentioned the 92 Williams F1 car that introduced traction control. That is my favorite F1 car living in Michigan that I have traction control now. And the same thing as the technology will kind of advance along and we'll start to see it trickle down. I do think there will be uh, high performance autonomous cars. Um, I'm interested on the legal aspects of that though. Could you program it to go faster on the highway if you wanted to? <laughs> but I think we'll start to see something go that way. Okay, so with this new technology, um, what how big of an impact do you think that's going to have, not only on jobs, but also businesses? Um, somebody made a comment about big cities, and we can see from big cities it started off as cabs, and then since technology has grown, we came up with Uber and Lyft, and there has been lawsuits and regulations on Uber drivers and Lyft drivers for not being certified or taking a test like cab drivers have. Um, I guess just, I just want to know, to expand on that, like what do you think business will, will do for that, how do you, how can you make a car certified for that kind of role? Because I see that becoming an issue. Well, well, employment is not just the, the cab driver side. I think the employment, uh, one of the the challenges I see that one of the few high school graduate reasonably paying jobs is truck driver. And that will be perhaps one of the first targets of an industry that would like to see a autonomous transportation or bus drivers or, or anyone who is paid to drive will be seen as a target for this new technology. And so there's certainly going to be job losses associated with it because that is one area you will invest in. As an employer, you will look at where your costs are and say, these are things that are expensive uh, how can I minimize them? Uh, so there will be some things that will be obvious, but there may be also lots of unintended losses and job changes uh, as a result. And it's only through conversations and analysis and thinking through the, the implications as to what will happen to how and where jobs are. What hap just, just thinking through perhaps on the, uh, the traumatic side of the future, which will be good, there will be less trauma there will be fewer accidents. If there are fewer accidents, at the moment, you don't have to go very far in a state like Michigan without a trauma center nearby. If you are in a serious accident, we would be able to manage the same density of trauma centers when trauma is much rarer. What will happen to employment in that? What happens to organ donations in a less traumatized future? Uh, all of these little aspects will eventually be identified uh, and my argument is is we should think about it now we should start tracing through every step of the way of what happens to different jobs what happens to different groups and how they may engage how they may benefit or how there may be a cost so it's not a matter of simply this is good or bad it is where will the benefits fall, where will the costs lie, uh, who will benefit, who will pay the cost, just getting an understanding of in a greater society where all of these different elements will fall. But I think employment is one that is certainly interesting. On the other hand, you have who's building and designing and making the new technology because that's on the creation side of jobs. 
Now let me point out that as long as I do home construction projects, there will be a need for a ready care, so there's no, <laughs> no problem. But I, I want to ask the panel a question, and, and it very well may be that, that this is really going to be a little bit out there, but recently there's been a lot of uh, what Lisa would call uh, vertical integration. That is, that many of the companies are beginning to try to make sure that they uh, essentially control the future of cobalt the future of lithium and other things. So I guess I'm throwing it to Hayter, I'm throwing it to, to any of you that might be aware of this. Are we looking at certain limits and restrictions on the future of this growth? That is, are there things that are gonna get in the way of the growth of autonomous cars simply because there isn't enough of specific precious metals or other things that are going to uh, have to, or a new technology is gonna have to be developed in terms of batteries or any other kinds of things, Hater, that you've been talking about? So, uh, so this is actually another aspect where we have really multiple uh, technologies kind of interacting with each other. Uh, so you brought the, the battery issue. In fact, there are, I don't know if I should even say this in public, but there are many engineers, in fact, they, they have a little bit faith that electric vehicle is gonna be really, the, you know, as successful as people would hope for. Uh, mainly because of the, uh, engineering challenges in actually designing batteries that could compete with, you know, regular, you know, fuel uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, cars that, you know, fueled by, by gas and so on. So, uh, so I, I think, you know, we need to make that distinction. I mean, in terms of autonomous vehicle, again, if I focus on the artificial intelligence, intelligence aspect of it, our biggest challenge is really, uh, you know, achieving human level of uh, perception and understanding. Uh, you know, I gave the example of right now the technology for pedestrian detection is about 97%. Now that sounds pretty good, but you know, 3% is still not acceptable of not being able to detect pedestrians. So to me, this is really, it's not so much about, you know, the material aspect or, you know, but you know, from an artificial intelligence point of view, it's really reaching, uh, all, basically we're targeting perfection. You know, in terms of, you know, uh, and we know if we human are literally perfect if we're sober, right? You know, uh, <laughs> as long as we're not texting while we're driving or we're not, you know, drunk while we're driving. So that, the, the AI part. Now, again, there are other parts, which is some people talking about, you know, having electrical vehicles that become, become autonomous. Then you're basically really looking at some other aspects of the technology. Like, can you build, uh, you know, batteries in electric vehicle that could drive from New York to LA without being charged, for example, or, you know, charged somewhere, you know, not every, you know, 100 miles or every 200 miles so on. So there are that, you know, uh, aspects where you, you bring these different technology, each of them, they have their own limitations. Well, I'm going to turn it back to you, Cynthia. Thank you to our panelists. And before you clap, I, I just want to offer in the state of Michigan, having a conversation about all things auto seems to make perfect sense. Um, we could imagine sitting in some other states where the question might have been flipped about what about walkability, right? That's really important in some communities and it spans across generations. And so even as we sit in probably the auto capital of the US, we need to think about the implications for communities and people that really do want walkability. And as we advance technology, how do we do it in a way that we don't disenfranchise the very need, if nothing more than for physical activity and health, to continue increasing walkability and bikeability and that we don't leave those options behind as we're racing ahead to other options, but that there's intentionality, that they don't just get to exist together, that we are intentional about how they exist together. Um, so I would like to ask the audience to thank our panel with me. I would like to thank all of you again for joining us and for such interesting questions and to encourage you to keep an eye out for 2018-2019. John and I will be meeting soon to semi-finalize those topics, but they promise to be as um, disparate and interesting in the future as they've been to date. We like to take on big challenges and 
bring in different parts of the campus and so you can look forward to that and just as a teaser I'm going to tease John every now and then you might see a different moderator other than John and I he, he doesn't want to hear that but I'll say it publicly now that every now and then we might play with another model and and have other moderators every now and then we'll see he might twist my arm later and tell me that's not an option but he's <laughs> Aut autonomous panel we can do it we can do that um, but again the panelists will be here for a bit if you want to ask them some questions and otherwise enjoy the balance of your evening and thank you again and thank you to those who have watched us during live stream